joining me today is someone synonymous with Manchester City for City fans. And that's journalist Ian Cheeseman. Hello, Ian. Hello, Ruth. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good. You must be delighted with Raheem Sterling performance last night, his goal against uh, Germany in the Euros for England. Absolutely. I mean, he's had a bit of stick um, from City fans, particularly towards the end of last season. Um, his involvement in the Champions League final was something that was questioned and given as one of the reasons potentially that they didn't win the Champions League. Um, this time he's had redemption uh, and he's, he's scored goals for England. Um, obviously, there are other England players in there that are City players too. I think Kyle Walker has been absolutely outstanding as a defender. Uh, yes. John Stones hasn't conceded a goal as one of the two central defenders. Um, but it's nice that, that City have got representation there. Um, whether Raheem Sterling is still a City player is up for discussion at the moment next season. But um, for now, at least, the City fans can be very proud of him. Oh, who's coming in for him? Who knows? I mean, there's been talk of various comings and goings. Uh, Jack Grealish and Harry Kane coming to City have, has been spoken about both in mm. potentially £100 million deals. And um, there's talk of players going out like uh, Bernardo Silva, uh, perhaps Riyad Mahrez, Merrick Laporte and Sterling at one stage. Uh, it was suggested he would be part of the deal to bring Harry Kane uh, to City. And if we believe what we, we read from the leaks, Sterling doesn't fancy that, doesn't fancy a move to Tottenham. I don't um, blame him. <laughs> well, me neither. But the fact is that, you know, if, if, well, he doesn't have to go anywhere he doesn't want to because he's under contract. Um, but if he gets the feeling that he's not wanted and the money's right, who knows what will happen. Um, so yeah. we'll see. We'll see. But um, maybe those who are at City, who are fans who may have doubted him, maybe feel a little bit more confident now that he is still got something to offer because of the the goals. You can go into a debate as to whether the standard of international football is at the same lower or higher level than Premier League football. And I personally mm. don't think it's anywhere near the quality of Premier League football. No. Um, so good performances for, for your international team don't equate necessarily to Premier League. I mean, uh, Phil Foden at the moment can't get into the England team and yet he's become a, a regular for Manchester City. So it works both ways. Um, mm. But I, I'm certainly pleased for Raheem Sterling. He seems an extremely... Um, grounded sort of individual from what we can tell when you you don't have much contact with multimillionaires anymore um, but he, he does seem to to be you know aware of his own situation of representing you know his own background um, and you know for that, for that alone uh, I'm, I'm really pleased for him yeah and perhaps his price has gone up since the goals yeah, that's another factor, I suppose. And the fact that Kane scored one might have added a, a bit more onto his value and Grealish was involved in, in one of the goals. So, yeah, in, when things go well like that, I mean, I remember Rio, Rio Ferdinand a few years ago had a fantastic summer. I think it was a World Cup, but, you know, it's only six or seven games, but he had a fantastic competition. And all it doesn't sound much now, um, a few a um, couple of months later, he moved from Leeds to United for 30 million, which seemed like a, an outrageous amount at the time. And it was largely due to what he did during the summer. So if City yeah. go on, sorry, if England go on and win this uh, Euro competition, suddenly the, the player who scores the winning goal or the one who makes the winning goal and those who contributed all the way through, everybody will think is unbelievably brilliant. Whereas, for example, if Germany had equalised last night when Muller broke free after... Yeah actually horrendous mistake by Raheem Sterling yes maybe everybody would be having a go at Sterling today uh, but you know Muller missed Sterling scored England got another goal they went through it's all forgotten so yeah. that, that's how much of on a knife edge football are football fans are fickle yes they are they are because when you speak about Foden you know I couldn't believe that it took him off in the first game because he was a better player and I thought I, I would have taken you know, someone else off because he was all over the place and he was such a great player. And then it's like you say, he struggled to get into the team since. And I don't know. I know Gareth Southgate spoke last night about we decided to match Germany man for man in the way they played. And that's why, you know, we put out the defensive team and it worked. But it's not kind of the team that 
you know, I like to see play. I like someone that's always going forward and always breaking and, you know, and dealing with the defence when it happens. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens on Saturday. Absolutely. And a lot of people who, particularly City fans who watch Fordham every week, will agree with you uh, as it happens. I think the team that was selected for that game was right. And I think he was right, actually, not to have Fordham in the start in 11. But um, there, there'll certainly be a lot of people who disagree with me on that. That's why what makes football so good, because it's, it's all about opinions. Nobody's right and wrong. It's just about having opinions. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is. Moving away from England and just putting that to one side, um, I introduced you as a Manchester City journalist first and foremost. So where and how did your love of City begin? Uh, well, it's interesting because I've been writing an autobiography in the last few months, so I've had a, been thinking about this quite a lot. Whether that autobiography ever gets published is another question, but it's a, an interesting exercise nevertheless. Um, where did it come from? Well, you know, I was quite a shy kid, uh, very, very quiet, didn't really fit in, maybe a bit of a geek, um, certainly not in with the in crowd. And um, I had a love of football, a genuine love of watching the game. Um, and when I actually got to attend a game for the first time when I was 10 uh, and came back to school, junior school, and said, oh, I went to the game last night, suddenly other people who were you know, the sort of bullies and the, the, the ones who you, you kept away from were coming to me saying, oh, you went to the game, you know, oh, right, what was it like? And I was accepted. And and whilst that wasn't the reason I went to the match and wasn't the reason I was a football fan, I thought, oh, this is quite nice. You know, suddenly mm -hmm. I fit in a bit more. Yeah. And, um, within a year or two, I was a season ticket holder with me dad and my credibility went up. But I've always been a studious um, fan. So rather than being the one, the type who, not that there's anything wrong with this, everybody's different, but I don't drink. So going and having 10 beers and being paralytic and swearing at the referee and, and all the rest of it is just not how I've ever been. So I would sit in the main stand, even when my mates would be stood on the kip -backs, and I would be um, studying the game and would be a lot more, a lot less emotional, which you could say pointed me in the direction of journalism. Um, I mean, I wanted to go to every game. Uh, it became an obsession, uh, became a steward on the football specials and um, went into hospital radio because I'd always had an interest in broadcasting, but uh, never had the confidence really to stand in front of people. Um, so radio was perfect as I could hide behind yes. the microphone and just imagine I was talking to one person, which is what I did. And that, and that led to an opportunity to do commentary on uh, City's club videos when they first started. And I enjoyed doing that. And I realised that getting time off work and the cost of going to football was, was starting to make it harder and harder. And so I sort of dreamed of the perfect scenario, which would be to get paid to go to the football and, and do the things I like to do, i.e. commentate and report on them. And although it sounds very easy, and there's a long story behind it. The opportunity came along eventually to live the dream, which I did. <clears throat> and I became a commentator and I commentated for City for the BBC for a long time. Commentated from the lower division um, right through to Sheikh Mansur coming and City winning the league with the Aguero moment and, and all that sort of stuff. So I've been very, very lucky um, to, to move into that, that area. Um, and, and so that, that's how my story unfolded, some of it by luck, some of it by massive determination um, and, and, and some of it by, by passion. So it's a combination of a few different things. Mm. Yeah, and I think when you say it, it didn't just happen overnight. I think, you know, people that have tried to get into journalism must know that it's, it's a very difficult profession to get into. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most competitive industries out there because you know, if you, if you, if I, I've been lucky enough again to be invited to go to universities and where they do media studies courses, and uh, and I can distinctly remember um, uh, standing in front of um, perhaps about thirty students and saying to them, um, you know, realistically, that all around universities all around the UK, 
there are practically every one of, the, of the, the universities will do a course like this. And there might be anywhere between 30 and 60 people on this course. And a rough estimate, I would say, one in you, of you people, one of the 30 of you might make a career of this uh, because it's so competitive. So many people want to do it. So many people want to be at a sporting event in the best seat and on the television, on the radio or whatever it might be. There are not that many roles. It's constant. The, the whole media is changing constantly anyway. It was different mm -hmm. when I started and it's very different now. But the odds of you actually achieving what you want to achieve are minuscule. And the, the course lecturer, took, he didn't have a go at me, but he took me on one side later and he said, that was a bit negative. You know, I said, listen, I'll just paint, paint a realistic picture because it's all right, you are on a three year course and, you know, and it's all well and good then playing around with video and radio and having pretend radio st uh, programs and TV programs. But eventually they're out there in the real world and it's very, very competitive and um, the chances of them making it are tough. So basically my message to them was, uh, as well as the other 29, you know, if, I took, if you were in that class and I was saying this to you, I'd say there's 20 other, nine other people in that class who all want to do what you want to do. So you've got to be the best of the 30. And then mm -hmm. there's another 30 in, in, in another university 10 miles away and they all want that job too. So you actually might be up against hundreds of people effectively to, to get where you want to get to. So my God, have you got to fight for it? And have you got, you've got to be good. You've got to be original. You know, you've got, you, you've got to have luck definitely, but you know, you've got to have a bit of an X factor to get there. Yeah. I mean, I can understand the, the lecturer telling you it's a little bit negative, but I suppose that, you know, it was enough that the people with the real desire, it would have kicked them on to, you know, really push themselves and, and do as best as they possibly can. But it's funny that you talk about lecturing like that, because I was doing an interview with Peter Smith a few weeks ago and he does lectures and he said he doesn't sugarcoat it either. You know, they can learn from books, but they don't know what it's like, you know, boots on the ground uh, to actually be there. And, and I think it's probably the best way. I mean, when I was at college doing a media course, um, we didn't have anybody come in and talk to us about what it was like. And we did make the television programs and whatever, you know, and I was lucky. I kind of left college, went straight into a community radio station. And and then after work there, I came to you and, you know, started with work experience and then a job. But um, and I think you're right, it is a lot of luck, but it is a lot of perseverance as well to keep knocking at the doors and making sure they open for you. Yeah, I mean, if I, I'll give you a little example of the sort of thing that they don't teach you in, in university or at, at college, which might seem irrelevant in some ways, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. I mean, I was in Porto just recently, for the Champions League final, mm. and I was covering the game for Indian TV. Um, and when I say covering the game, basically I was um, joining them uh, via Skype, ironically, um, onto their main TV channel in India. So there were millions of people watching, but I was the reporter in the stadium. So my job was to do half an hour or so of talking to their studio guests, two former City players, David James, who also went on to play for Liverpool, the goalkeeper, England keeper, and Terry Phelan, former Wimbledon and City fullback. So they were in the studio in India. I'm in the stadium in Porto. I had to do half an hour on Skype ahead of the game. And then at full time, I did another 25 minutes or something on Skype from the stadium afterwards. Now, to get there, I had to have, uh, and by the way, they didn't pay my expenses. Um, I had to have three COVID tests, one before I went, one while I was there, another while, while I was uh, back in the UK. Um, the result of the one while I was in Porto didn't come through quickly enough. So when I got to the stadium, I had to queue in the baking hot sunshine for another hour in theory to have another test. And just as I got to the front of the queue, finally my result came through <laughs> from the one I had while I was there. Um, <laughs> so by then you're very stressed, you're very, very tired. Uh, and then um, when it came to the, to the game itself, uh, you know, I, I thought I had arrived in plenty of time. I knew they wanted me half an hour before kickoff. Um, I actually got there two hours before. Um, once I got into the stadium, I couldn't find where I was supposed to pick my ticket up from. 
and was and was and literally walked all the way around the inside of the stadium carrying two bags in in heat to try to find it when i eventually found it i got in a queue with several other journalists when i got to the front of the queue they said ah you're in your television you're in the wrong queue so that got all been for nothing as well so i said well there's any chance i could take one of your your food and drink bags that you're giving out to the press then because you know I've, I've, i'm exhausted just to get a bit of water and a, anything an apple or something no you can't have those you have a separate uh, allocation for television so then i waited at the ua for office probably for 20 minutes till they came back from wherever they'd been they said they didn't give food and drink to journalists gosh oh you've just broken up there ian you just froze hmm. okay well perhaps um by design as you're talking about the problems that can happen when you're you know getting to grounds and broadcasting quite often lines go down and ours went down just as you're trying to talk us through that so let's go back to your story you were talking about your arrive at the ua for office yeah and um so eventually when the ua for representative turns up um, i say all the other press i've noticed actually have a seat number on a piece of paper that they've been given so can you tell me what my seat number is please and they said, uh, oh, you don't have a seat number. Um, you just got a space that's allocated to you. I forgot to mention that I'd already climbed up four flights of stairs to the press box uh, when I was looking for where I was supposed to go. They then sent me back down this, those four flights of steps that took me to the two offices. So I'd already, with all my gear, walked up and down four flights of steps um, in this baking heat. When I got back down to the bottom, they said, they showed me a plan and said, see that seat there? And I went, yeah, and they said, that's your seat. Uh, so just go up, go up and sit in that. So I so just go up and find it myself. Yeah, yeah, there'll probably be somebody up there. So I go back up the four flights of steps again, and I try to picture in my mind where this seat is, and I look for it, and I can't find it. I see a guy with a UEFA blazer on and say, <laughs> Apparently, uh, my seat is allocated somewhere, but I can't find it. Have you got a map? No, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Eventually, somebody from a rival, not that we're really rivals, but a rival TV company or whatever, said, what are you looking for? And I explained, and he said, I'm sure I've seen that somewhere, follow me. And we found it, somebody else was sat in the seat. So we had to ask nicely that this other person move away. And eventually I sat down. Now I estimate that that whole palaver had probably taken the best part of an hour and a half. So by the time I actually sat down, I had Sony TV saying, where are you, where are you? So I was very conscious of the fact that I was, you know, causing a problem for them, if you like. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind that early in the afternoon, I'd had that hour in the sun queuing up for another COVID test. and. Yeah. I knew I had to at some point make my way down to where all the fans were because I do a match day vlog on my YouTube channel. But in the end, I only had two hours to do everything I needed to do, which would normally take longer, even at a domestic game. So I was warm and stressed before I got to the stadium. Then I went through all that. And then as I sat down and set up my gimbal and my phone, within seconds, Sony TV connected to me and said, can you come on straight away? So I, with no preparation time whatsoever, no chance to get my head sorted out, no chance to come down from all that, that angst. Yeah. Um, I had to be, hello, how are you doing? Yeah, oh yeah, and uh, sort of bluffing my way through it and hoping that I can, I've noticed in the corner of my eye while I'm speaking what the team is, because I've not even had time to go on social media and actually speak with authority like I know what I'm talking about. So... You can sit in a university class or a college class and spend hours saying, well, what you do is you do this and you write out your team sheet and you, you prepare and you have some, you know, answers. Not in, sometimes in the real world, you get none of that. And yeah. you just have to deal with it. And it's no use me sitting there on Sony TV saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what the team is because I've had a bit of hassle inside the stadium. Or, yeah. You know, I don't know whether he's playing because... 
I've not had a chance to look yet. Or it's, nobody's interested in that. Yeah. You've got to be absolutely at the top of your game immediately. Yeah, yeah, you have. Yeah, and, and your heart must be beating away because you know that your time's getting close to getting on air and you've still not got your seat. You talk about two heavy bags. Um, can you tell people what were in your heavy bags? What kind of equipment you're carrying around every time you go to a match? Um, well, uh, let me show you this. This will wobble a bit, but I'll take, at the moment, I mean, when I was working for the BBC, I was taking ISDN kits and things like that. But for mm. now, I take a gimp, what they call a gimbal. Mm -hmm. um, which, All right, okay. Which um, means that I can... I'll put it back on the gimbal now, you see, me, me camera, my phone, whatever you want to call it. Um, make sure we've got this the right way around. Um, and I've got lighting, I've got um, an extension for um, potentially a microphone. Um, you know, there's all sorts of bits and bobs. Here we are, we're back now, are we? Yeah, there we go. Um, so, yeah, obviously things like notepads, you know food in there and uh, potentially or you know just just when i worked for the bbc it was slightly different because then i had a big isdn kit with headphones and lots of cabling and you know you've got you've got chargers you've got you know foreign plug sockets that you know you've got to convert to when you're abroad. Oh, yeah. so just lots of bits and bobs that you need to to have with you can you just explain what an ISDN kit is for those that don't know? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's a small mixer. Um, I mean, let me see. It's probably about that size. Um, that yeah. lays on top of the table. Um, it can be a little bit smaller than that. And on that, you plug in your microphone, your headphones. You've got control of volume levels. And it is effectively like a telephone call. But rather than it doing, doing through a telephone line it's done through uh you know a, a much higher uh, it's like having 5g if you like you know it's, it's like uh, but it's a landline so in theory you're not going to get disconnected it's personal to you and it's high quality which means that i can be sitting in porto and the quality even though we're talking now um you know quite a few miles apart by skype and hopefully the quality is good you know, but in the old days when you used to do it on a telephone line, it used to sound like a telephone line. Yeah. So this is the upgrade on the telephone line to mean, and you can have two-way conversations. So while you're actually commentating or talking, a producer or somebody can be saying in your ear, um, as they often do when you're watching something on television, they'll be feeding you with some information. I mean, at local radio level, as I was for many years, um, although that did happen occasionally, I wouldn't say people were feeding me stats or information, but they might be telling me that uh, Bolt Wanderers had just scored a goal or something and that I should go and cross over for an update. So that was a type of information, you know, that you might get. Um, so that, that's what an ISDN is. And, and at the Aguero goal in 2012, um, I was sat there with my headphones and microphone with a co-commentator next to me. I had headphones and microphone on, of course. And... Um, as the Aguero goal went in, my co-commentator leapt into the air um, and went crazy. And uh, and I was more in control, even though it was a huge emotional moment for me. But I was trying to be professional, although I was trying to sound on the radio like I was out of control. <laughs> but I had to always be in control. Otherwise, you end up swearing and doing all sorts yeah. on doing what he did, which was completely to be unaware of his surroundings. And because he leapt up with such ferocity um, and the wires were all connected to this ISDN equipment, the equipment crashed onto the floor. All the cables came unconnected and we went off air at the biggest moment in Manchester City's history. Oh, my goodness. So another good example of that, me being a passionate City fan, so I'm already emotional that they've just won the league. I've now got my co-commentator going mad next to me who I need to control a bit. And my equipment's just fallen on the floor and we've gone off air. So while everybody else is jumping about cheering, I have to plug it all back in and pray that it hasn't been fatally damaged and get us back yeah. on air as quickly as possible. So, which I did, you know. So um, those are the types of things you can never, ever be taught in college. <laughs>
No, and it's funny because one of the questions I'd written down to ask you, and I thought you kind of answered it earlier on in that the way you, you know, when you started watching football, you were very analytical and you didn't really spend time with your friends at the main road. And one of the questions was going to be, how do you control your emotions, whether it's a really bad defeat or, you know, a victory like that where you're just elated? Um, and I thought you were going to say, no, you don't you don't get kind of like that because, you know, you're more analytical. But clearly you did. I mean, it's a fantastic moment, isn't it, when you win the league? And it's just so to have all that emotion going on and then your co-commentator and when you plugged back in, I imagine that the producers were going mad at the other end because the line had dropped and they wanted to know what was going on. It must have been a chaos, really. Yeah, it was. I mean, for the 45 seconds, it felt like about an hour. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it was actually 45 seconds that it took me to get us back on air. Uh, other presenters at other grounds, because that day United could have won the league. Bolton got relegated, so there was a lot going on in the mm. Great Manchester area. Um, during that particular time frame, they filled in, you know, up oh, into lost the in there at the Etihad. Um, so what's going on at United? Steve Wyatt. So he would take over, and then Jack Dearden would explain what had happened with the Bolton game at Stoke. And by the, and by the time I'm going, I'm back, I'm back, get me on. You know, they went, and Ian's back now, and very calmly handed back to me. And, uh, <laughs> and then we just carried on. So, um, you know, it felt like, like forever, as I say, while, while that was happening. But, uh, you know, people have said to me so many times down the years, you know, how do you not swear? How do you not, you know, lose control? Um, and, and all I can say is that I am a, actually a very emotional person. So I channel it. I channel the emotion. Now, if, I, if you sat with me at a City game, uh, the opening day of the season, they play Norwich. And the way things are at the moment, chances are I won't be in the press box. I'll be sat in the normal stand with everybody else because um, I'm not doing as much in, in uh, as a journalist as I would like to um, at the moment. So chances are I'll just be sat in the game. And if against Norwich, City score a great goal, I'll uh, people around me will think, he's not very emotional. But if you put a microphone in front of me and ask me to commentate on exactly the same game, I'd be going, ah, oh, what a great goal. Now, that's not false. It's, it's just that the emotion is in me even when, you're, when I don't show it. But when I, I get that radio, television, whatever, is a performance and I understand the media. So when I was doing, when I do stuff for Sony TV, it's much more considered because it's post-match and pre-match for a television audience. If I'm doing a radio commentary, which is meant to be partisan, i.e. for local radio, or if I was doing it for the club or something, I would be a lot more emotional. If I was doing it for Five Live, i.e. a network station, where I'm meant to be more neutral, I would do it in a different style again. you know. And if I was doing it for television, where people can see the pictures, I would do it in a different style again. They're all different ways of doing it. I've just been asked in the last couple of days next season to do some commentary for Bolton Wanderers for their iPlayer, as they call it, um, which is can be either audio or visual or both. But some people will listen on audio only. And it's for a Bolton Wanderers audience. Now, I'm not a Bolton Wanderers fan, but I understand the role. So when I do that commentary, I will do it from a partisan, not biased, but partisan, Bolton Wanderers perspective because that's what the audience is and that's what they want from me. Yes. So you have to understand who it is you're broadcasting to, what they want from you and the different demands of that role. And I am capable of doing that. So to get back to the original question, I am very emotional watching City, but if I'm not actually working, it might not look like it. On the other hand, when I am working, people actually think I'm losing control. So it's a it's a juxtaposition, isn't it? it I'm, is. I'm actually somewhere in the middle in reality. But, You're in uh, control in both situations. But yeah. again, going back to your previous point, that's something that you can't teach, you know, to no. to students. It's something that you have to learn and understand, you know, the parameters of each employer, what they want from you. Absolutely. I mean, I write a column, a weekly column in a newspaper now. I've written three or four books and 
the books have all been different. You know, one was written with, in, in theory, was was the words of Vincent Company telling the story of a season. And I had to, half of that book, I'll be honest with you, he didn't tell me, I made it up because I wasn't given access to him like I should have been. And they wanted the book to be his words about something. So I had to sort of second guess what I thought he'd say, um, which is a skill in itself. Yeah. Um, and you know, he must have been a bit nervous doing that, you know, in case he looked at it and went, well, no, I wouldn't have said something like that. The, yeah, maybe a little bit. The reality, though, is that I don't think he cared. <laughs> um, and I don't think he'd ever read it. So, uh, and, I, and, and again, that comes from years of experience. If you'd asked me the same question 20, 30 years ago, if I'd been doing that book, I would have been far more nervous about it mm. and probably would have expected him to be a lot more critical of it but i'm not even convinced he's ever read it um, right. so as long as uh, the only way he would get involved would be if i'd put some words into his mouth that were controversial or yes. that somebody would absolutely pick him up on and then he'd go well i never said that look to that bit and go that's not me why did you say that so mm -hmm. the fact that there's never been any controversy nobody's ever contacted me means i did a, an okay job a good thing <laughs> Yeah, gosh, that's really difficult, Ian. Um, you talk about uh, how difficult it was at Porto, but how difficult has it been or, or how different, if not difficult, this last 18 months with everything going on with COVID and restrictions being in place? Frankly, it's been awful. Um, I, I mean, I um, before COVID struck, uh, Manchester City were using my match day vlog that I do on, on YouTube on their club website and they were paying me a fee uh, which was great because obviously that's, that's an income stream. Um, as soon as Covid came along they said we don't want them any, I mean obviously for a while there were no games mm. but when the games resumed I said well um, I can do them now on Zoom and do them virtually and they said well no we don't want that, not interested. And anyway, we're trying to make cost cutting. So thanks very much for everything you've done in the past, but we don't want it anymore. Um, so I had no access to matches. Um, I'd gone from the 1970s until City played Arsenal in the first game behind closed doors, virtually without missing a City game home and away. Um, it's been my obsession. It's been my life. So uh, I'd never um, watched City on live TV in my life. Never watched a game. Uh, and that might seem hard to believe, and uh, but I can honestly say that from being born to the Arsenal game, the first one behind closed doors, that was the first City match I've ever sat down in front of a television and watched live on TV. I've watched highlights, of course. Um, I've been sat mm -hmm. in the press box with the TV on so I can mm. watch the replays. But yes. I've never actually been at home watching a game. Um, my natural habitat is to be at the game and that's the be all and end all for me um, so um, I hated it um, I'll be honest as well I didn't agree with football returning in a pandemic um, my father at the time was in a care home and was very ill and I wasn't allowed to see him so watching pictures of footballers playing football, dancing about and hugging each other. Yes. While I couldn't go and visit my dad, who was basically dying, um, absolutely killed me. And um, I uh, didn't I didn't agree with football carrying on. Um, now we're in the situation where we are as we're speaking, where crowds are coming back and the pandemic is easing thanks to the vaccines. That's a different argument, but back in June of 2020, and even the for the most of last season, um, I, I don't agree with the games going ahead. On the other hand, I understand how people who've been feeling very down um, and been locked up at home because of lockdown might have massively welcomed the fact that they could watch matches on TV, and that may have done them a lot of good for them, their mental health. So I, I respect that. I mean, a mate of mine said it's done him the power of good to be able to watch games. Um, so I completely respect that. My own personal view is that the games should not have continued. Um, towards the end of the season, I started to do some work for Sony TV India, which got me into several games behind closed doors. And they were horrible. They were horrible. It was great to be back on 
working again and reporting on City, which which is obviously what I've always wanted to do and, and consider to be the thing I do best. So to be there and valued and earning a bit of money and, and, and actually in the stadium was a huge for me. But I can't deny it, it was actually horrible to be in an empty stadium. Um, it really was horrible. I hated it, every minute of it. Um, right towards the end of the season, the League Cup final was allowed a small crowd. Uh, the Champions League final had a small crowd. Um, Everton game, the last home league game, had a small crowd. So things started to return a little bit more to normal. Um, but and, I, and, and away from what, whatever I feel about uh, behind closed doors, the standard of football, in my opinion, last season was nowhere near the standard of football normally. I think we can see now in the Euros... Uh, games we saw two games the day before yesterday as we're speaking where a team was two goals down with a few minutes to go and came back and, and took it into extra time by scoring two late goals I don't believe that would have happened if those games had been in empty stadiums I don't think we see uh, the game is not as physical in empty stadiums because the referees have no crowd reacting um, that all they have is the players uh, wincing very loudly you know and <laughs> Every time anybody touched a player, they could just go blow on them and they, they'd have yeah, free kick. And the football was played, in my again, it's only my opinion, two-thirds to three-quarters at best of the tempo that a game's normally played at. It just wasn't for me. City won the league. Great, I'm a City fan. Uh, I te- I, I'll be honest, I didn't really get any emotion from that. I uh, didn't feel any... I mean, if you compare that to every other time they've won the league... It's just a statistic in a book for me. Yeah, they won the league in 20, 2020, 2021. You know, it's it's on the board, but I didn't live any part of it, and I and I don't I, I don't feel like it. I owned it. It wasn't. I never saw it. I saw one game in the whole season. In in thirty eight league games, I attended one match. That was the Everton game. So it didn't feel didn't feel right. Um, so. No, I mean, I'll, I can't tell you how pleased and excited I am that hopefully, fingers crossed, from the beginning of the season, everybody's back and we return to normality. Yes, we've got to live with the disease and yes, um, it, you know, it took a lot of lives that we wish it hadn't. It didn't take my dad's life, but indirectly it did because he was suffering from dementia and as he deteriorated, I wasn't able to be with him. And I believe that if I'd have been able to go and see him as I had been doing every day for a minimum of an hour every day, taking him out places, keeping his spirits up, that who knows, maybe he still would have gone by now, um, six, nine months later. But I'll never know. But certainly the moment I was no longer allowed to see him and touch him, he went over a cliff and passed away in September and... um, you know that, uh, so so I, I feel great empathy for those who've lost people directly or indirectly to COVID. Um, but personally, now that we're where we are with the vaccines, it's time to return to normal and live with it. And for me, whose life centres around attending football, attending theatre, musical theatre, which I'm a massive fan of, of going on holidays, which I live for. So the three things that are the most important things in my life, apart from, of course, my family, um, are, are the things that have been taken away. And so I've, I've struggled a bit with, uh, with mental health. Um, hopefully, um, when the new season starts, I'll be back at grounds and I'll be back doing some of the things that I, I love to do. And, um, you know, and, and we can all enjoy hugging each other again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really sorry, Ian, about your dad. It must have been awful. Um, but I do take your point about the fans missing. At first, I quite like watching the matches, you know, when you could hear what the players were saying and the bench. But I think, you know, Alex Ferguson used to talk a lot about the crowd were the, the 12th man. And I think, you, you know, like you say, you've really seen a difference in the Euros. It almost, sometimes it just felt like it was a training match between two teams when you were watching the Premiership. And, one time what I really noticed was we turned on to watch a match and United were losing and you turned on, it was halfway through 
turned on United were losing normally the crowd would have told you that before you know you got the the score up and there was no sign and there was no mutual sympathy you know in the the stadium with the people watching the the empathy was gone because there wasn't anybody there to feel that you know sadness with that your team was losing and yeah I mean the Euros have been fantastic because most of the quality of the football has been good hasn't it well, I still think that the Premier League is far superior to what we're watching on the field in the Euros, but the excitement is back. Um, mm. and, uh, you know, you can you can feel it from from the terraces. Uh, uh, I mean, I suspect that neither you are, or I have a great deal of love for Liverpool, but Liverpool lost six home league games in a row during the absence of fans. I can't really imagine that happening with fans. It's never happened in their history before. Mm. You know, they've lost a lot of games at Old Trafford um, that I'm sure they wouldn't have lost in normal circumstances. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know that we can we can be subjective about it, you know, and we can have a laugh at Liverpool for losing six at home, but uh, it, the, the crowd just wouldn't accept it. But but when you're in a stadium where there's no jeopardy, when the, there's no booing, yes. Know, there's no animosity. That booing yeah. and animosity it drives you on as much as the positive cheering does. In fact, I think it probably drives you on more. The fear of we, we can't lose another home game or we'll all get booed off and yeah. the manager will get the sack. Yeah. Yeah. You know, may, maybe if we'd have been playing in a full stadium, maybe this is an outrageous thing to say, but if we'd have been playing in a full stadium, perhaps Klopp would have got sacked for losing six games at home because all of the Anfield crowd would have been booing every week but we'll never know because no. nobody knows how they would have reacted you know i did feel for liverpool though you know two seasons back when they won the premiership and then they couldn't have the fans there to have the celebration and i thought that that must be awful you know the first time in however many years and you still must be grateful that you've won but to not be able to share it intimately with your supporters it, it must feel a bit hollow really yeah, I mean, I've got no love for Liverpool fans, particularly after what they, when they bricked the city coach and and various other incidents have happened. However, um, you know what social media is like. I'm quite active on Twitter, and um, there were a lot of city fans, particularly calling for the game season to be null and voided when COVID first struck. Yeah. And I suspect a lot of the motivation from that from those city fans was because they simply didn't want Liverpool to win the league. Yeah, um, I said publicly that I didn't think the football should continue. Now, that's a very different thing because, in my opinion, what should have happened is that uh, football should have returned in about April of this year. And we should have picked up where we were when COVID struck. So Liverpool would have still gone on and won that season, but they were already well They're ahead. ahead yeah. And then the very thing you're talking about, which is the being able to enjoy it, Whilst I don't like Liverpool fans, I'm sure there are lots of good Liverpool fans who are like you and me. And I do feel sorry for those people that they didn't have a chance after mm -hmm. such a long time to celebrate. And if that meant that we didn't win the league because one season was missed out, I could, I could live with that. So despite some Liverpool fans on social media, because it can be quite poisonous, thinking that I was calling for it to be null and voided, I never said that, never wanted it to be null and voided just didn't want it to be played. And I agree and actually have said that I felt sorry for Liverpool fans for not being able to celebrate together. That that was a, a real shame. The only um, consolation I can take is it was Liverpool fans and I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, Ian. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't mind Liverpool. But it's like you say, there's good and bad in all fans in all clubs and uh, and i think probably there's more that have got their head on the right way than haven't i hope so i hope so that's the best positive way to take it mm. but um when you said about this season well last season as it is now with city and it didn't mean anything to you you know kind of them winning because of what had happened throughout the season i would say don't take it for granted <laughs> you know the winning season, season out because I know that I did for a long time with United and now you know we haven't got it as season in season out it's like oh, I'll never take it for granted again it's um it hurts yeah I get that I mean it depends um and and obviously this is all about opinion 
the whole conversation is about opinion, isn't yeah. it? But um, you know, as a as a City fan, who um, first my first games were when City had Bell, Lee, Summerby, and they they just won the league. Uh, so I didn't see them win the league with Bell, Lee, Summerby. I was just too young. But they, I was watching the same team immediately after that, and they had some success for a little while and. Um, had a great team and, you know, I saw them finish second to Liverpool in 77, saw them win the League Cup in 76. But then we had all this time where they were terrible, frankly, and going down into the lower divisions and everything. So I've never taken anything for granted. But my pleasure of watching my team is not based on, on success. Success is nice, but that is not the driving force. And this might seem a controversial statement to say, and obviously I can imagine United fans and Liverpool fans listening to me saying this might 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 sort of laugh at this or, or, or whatever, but if City never won another trophy in my lifetime, it wouldn't bother me. Um, I've seen them win uh, pretty much everything in the best possible way. No, nothing can ever beat that Aguero season. And nothing will ever even equal it. We could win the league for the next 10 years in a row and I don't think he would ever come close to winning that first one because of the length of time that had happened. Yes. Uh, you know, all the struggles we'd gone through to get to that point. It was like the, the releasing of all that, that emotion. Um, I'd, I'd like to see City win the Champions League. I'm not desperate to do it, but I would like to, purely because if you have an imaginary CV as a fan, then that completes the CV. Yes, it does. Win everything. So if we'd have beaten Chelsea in the Champions League final, that would have completed the CV, albeit not in ideal circumstances, because it was a small crowd. Not everybody who wanted to be there could have been. So yeah. I'm not sure how I felt about that at the time, but of course I wanted them to win it. Mm. I'd rather they're going to win it, win it next year when all the crowds are back yeah. so that, that we can enjoy it together. Yes. But, but really... Um, of course, of course, I want my team to win the league. Of course, I want my team to win everything they enter. But it isn't the be-all and end-all for me. Um, you know, Chelsea won the Champions League a few years ago. I think they beat Bayern Munich in the final, I remember rightly. And, mm. and all the way through that season, they played awful football and ground out games by counter-attacking and stealing a goal and winning the game. And if that had been City doing that, Yes, they've got that little notch on the bedpost or that that you know that that um, thing on the CV. But would I really enjoyed that? Would that have given me satisfaction seeing them just do whatever had to be done to win? No, winning is not the be all and end all. Under Pep Guardiola, I've seen a team play, you know, really glorious, entertaining football. It was the same under Manuel Pellegrini. Actually, he played his team played great football. So, if you, if you finish second in the league, if you finish runners up in the FA Cup final and you win your runners up in the Champions League final, certain types of fans would say, really disappointed with that. What a terrible season. I wouldn't. I'd say, what, what, what do you want? We just played brilliant. I had a great season. Travel all over the country as a fan. You know, I've been with all my mates at home games and just sat there at times and gone, wow, wasn't that good? That'll do for me. And it, it, winning the competition is just the cherry on the cake. Um, and certainly, as I say, last season of all the seasons is a season to forget. And um, mm. I, I made a conscious effort at the beginning of it all that I wasn't going to watch any of the games behind closed doors. So I watch the City games because I do a weekly podcast because I because I make my living from talking about City. So I couldn't. Yeah, you had that. work to do. But I never watched any other games. Never watched a single game. So last night we were watching a game uh, and my son said to me something like, you know, let, let, I'm, I'm making this up now. This didn't actually happen. But let's say we were talking about Yarmolenko, who plays for Ukraine, who plays for, for West Ham. And my, my son might have said to me, oh, he had a good season last season, like uh, Yarmolenko. Uh, and and I would my answer to that was, apart from the two games when West Ham played City, you I had no know. idea what he did. I didn't follow it. I didn't watch it. Couldn't care less. Yeah. I sat there in silence watching the City games. So if Yarmolenko missed both City games, that means I didn't see him last season. 
I'm not, I've seen more of the Euros than I saw of the Premier League last season. I think, you know, that's such a lovely attitude to have that if you enjoy the football match, the score doesn't matter to a degree. And I think, no, I, I don't think I could do that somehow. But I'm with you. That's um, why you're a United fan. Yeah, because <laughs> we're used to success, Ian. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about, well, you're not getting it now. It's, it's, it's all about winning for United fans. Um, yeah. And there is a new generation of City fans who feel exactly the same. And going forward, we are, as a club, we are morphing into your club. And I don't like your club, and I've never liked your club, because I don't like the fact that they're out of touch with um, ordinary fans, and that most of the fans, not all, but most of the fans, the only thing that matters is winning. Whereas my, our club, not through choice, perhaps because of circumstances, have got used to... Uh, laughing at ourselves, being having dark humour, uh, of, of walking away from a 4-0 defeat and saying, ah, well, so what? You know, we've had a good time, haven't we? Uh, and that's a mentality that, that a certain age group, particularly of City fans, have, still have. But it's something that can't be understood by fans of the ones who only care about winning. So within the City fan base, there is a big dilemma really at the moment because you've got a lot of new younger fans coming along who are used to success mm. demand success and that so finishing second in the champions league there were some city fans on social media saying pep's never going to do it get rid of him and, and you think what you know you're watching the best football you've ever had you've just won the league yes. and the league cup and you want to get rid of the manager because he didn't win the champions league that's the mentality that you know that that Chelsea have had with sacking all their managers. That's the that's starting to be a bit more of what happens at United now. You know, if yeah. you don't win a trophy, you move on to the next manager and constantly. Or even if you do, I mean, Van Hall went. Van Hall was sacked and they'd won the FA Cup. But um, but I'm with you when you talk about that kind of first winning the Premiership. You know, because I'd been a United supporter since I was what primary school so there had been quite a few years of not having anything and not winning and that first time it's just it is the sweetest and then the treble winning season you know you're never going to do that again and it's just you know those two for me the first time of winning the premiership and the treble season are just the pinnacle and whatever comes in between or after it's it's never going to have that same connection but um but I think you're right. I think we do kind of think about winning all the time. And, you know, with Ollie, at least we've got someone that understands the club and, you know, kind of how to put a team out to attack. And I wonder sometimes, and I was thinking about it before the Germany game last night, because I've been reading Henry Winter's book, um, 50 Years of Hurt, all about England and, you know, why we expect so much from England. And I always used to think it was, you know, we expect them to win all the time because we're putting together supposedly the best of the best in England together in a team and then we expect them to gel overnight and suddenly you know be able to play great and then I thought or is it because you know I'm, I'm a United supporter and I expect United to win every match and so therefore I then transfer that on to England and I, I haven't really come to a conclusion but um, the last World Cup before it started, I said to Drew, I'm not going to get into backing England because, you know, you get so intense with them and then they let you down. And, you know, you're heartbroken because they haven't got as far as you expect them to get. And then Gareth Southgate came along with this team that, you know, were just so confident and so happy together. And they, he seemed to have cracked it. You know, they gelled. And when they got to the semi-final and they lost, I wasn't upset. I was like, there's real positivity here, you know, for future years and future tournaments because he's done something that other England managers don't seem to have done. And I did kind of come away with that feeling of like, no, I feel really positive even though we've lost the semi-final. You know, there's there's something there for the future to keep building on. Yeah, well, I mean, my views on international football in England are that and uh, I don't mean this to sound like a downer because obviously lots of people celebrating a famous victory against Germany, but um, that, that's the worst Germany team I've seen uh, for a long, long time. Yes. Uh, that England beat. Um, 
the three performances in the group games from England, I thought were, were all pretty ordinary at best. Mm. Um, but, you know, as football fans, we're all fickle and it's all about the results. And as I said to you quite early on in this interview, if Raheem Sterling's pass had been scored by Muller and it had gone 1-1 and somehow City had gone out of the game, everybody's view of Raheem Sterling would have been completely different. And the view of Gareth Southgate might have been completely different. And the view of the, this new, young, exciting squad might have been completely different. Now in the semi-final, uh, sorry, the quarter-final, City are going to play City. England are going to play Ukraine. Um, they should win that comfortably, frankly. I mean, I watched a bit of the Sweden-Ukraine game mm. last night and neither of those looked very good at all, actually. I mean, if you think about previous Ukraine teams with Shevchenko in the side, they were a better side then. They're a worse side than they were. Germany are worse side than they were. The Dutch, yeah. wow, I've seen so many better teams than the Dutch side. Even the Italians, as good as people have been raving about them, this is not a great Italian team. The best yeah. team in the tournament, in my opinion, the only one that actually looks as if it would have been able to go head-to-head -head with some of the great uh, international teams of the past is Belgium. Um, they have mm -hmm. some quality players. Um, they're still, you know, um, not at the level of, you know, Holland with uh, Van Basten and Ruud Hullet and whatnot, yes. or Germany with, with, with the great players they've had in the past. And even some of the England teams, I'll be honest with you, um, I, I genuinely think that the the Gaza team uh, that lots of people have talked about of 96 yeah. is actually a better team than this one that's playing now. But this England team has had the look of the draw. Uh, the, the opposition isn't isn't necessarily as good. Um, uh, and and who knows, maybe they could go on and win it. I suspect that the way the draw is opened up, it's obviously, to me, it feels like it's going to be Spain against uh, England in the semis. Um, this Spain team is nowhere near as good as it was with Xavi and Iniesta and uh, Fernando Alonso and, and on other players. So this isn't, it, it's an okay team, but it's yeah. not unbeatable. So it feels to me as if it could easily be Belgium versus England in the final. And if Belgium beat them, do all the world suddenly get fickle again? I'm talking about England fans now. Do they get all fickle and say, oh, I should have won that and Gareth's not any good and that was Raheem Sterling's fault? Or did they go away saying, you know what, we got to a final and that was great. Be interesting to see how the story develops because mm -hmm. unless you win it, you, you you are a loser, but by different degrees. Yes, but I think that England team I was talking about in the World Cup that I came away from the semi-final feeling positive about, something's happened because that team that we watched then are not the team, like you say, that we're watching now. The they have, you know, done enough in each game, but they've not shown much flair. And whether that's down to management of the positions and players being played out of position, or whether that's just because I, maybe they're tired, you know, from playing matches every two or three days during the Premiership, I don't know. But something's not quite, the spark isn't quite there all the time. You touched on something before when you talked about the expectation level. And in this country, um, the expectation level, the scrutiny under which England is put is absolutely intense. And mm. if I was an England player, um, I would be scared all the time when I play. I would be worried about making the mistake. about miss. I mean, how many years are we going to go about Gareth Southgate missed that penalty? Um, it's gone. Forget it. But every time we come up against uh, Germany or we go into any penalty shootout, that'll be trotted out again. Yeah. Um, and so therefore, no wonder England struggle at penalty shootouts because mm. in their mind, when a player comes to the penalty spot, they're thinking, if I miss this, it'll be shown for the rest of my life and I will get vilified for it. Um, and that type of pressure is what makes it hard for England um, more than any other country, I believe. Um, because because there is an un unrealistically high expectation because we have the fantastic Premier League and you know and, and we, we do well in European competitions that the England team is expected to win things both to a certain extent by the rest of the world but certainly by our own people and our own press and that pressure I, I couldn't cope with it I couldn't cope with it 
No, you're right. It must be intense. And they were, I can't remember who was being interviewed the other day. I don't know if it was Foden or if it was Saka. And they were talking about the German game and uh, penalties. Should it go to penalties? It might have been Saka. And they were asking him, are you prepared to take a penalty? And have you been practising? And he said, we've not been practising penalties. We've been practising about what we're going to think as we walk up to the spot. And I thought that tells you everything, you know, what you were just talking about, Gareth, that penalty miss. He knows what that's like, that walk and how awful it is. And then what happens afterwards if you don't. And I thought it was really interesting that he was, you know, having them training on what to think positive thoughts as they're walking up to that spot to take the the kick. I was quite um, enthused when they said that. I was like, maybe they will be all right. I mean, there's a good example, not an international example, but Liverpool's goalkeeper in the Champions League final when they lost, who uh, dropped a bit of a clanger. And he was basically hounded on social media and never kicked a ball again for Liverpool. That was a penalty he, you know, he paid for making one mistake in one big game. Yeah. Uh, I watched the game the other night, I forget who it was against. You might remember it better than me. When the goalkeeper did an ab, you know, when the ball was played back and it was an own goal, and the goalkeeper missed it and it trickled into his own net. I think it was the Portuguese oh, goalkeeper. I, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. They actually went on. Whoever the team was, whether it was Portugal or not, went on to win the game. So it's sort of forgotten now. So that won't be played over and over to him mm. again. But if that had been a defeat, he would, you know, if, especially if that had been an England player that did. Imagine that had happened last night. And as I say, we come back to it for a third time. If Sterling's misplaced pass had been scored by Thomas Muller, the whole narrative around Raheem Sterling would be completely different than yes. the narrative that there is now because he scored three goals in four games. Yeah. It's, it's such fine margins. Mm. We are very cruel in this country about anything going wrong. So you can understand why people are so um, tense. And, you know, England's games have all been extremely cautious. Mm. Ironically, the teams like Ukraine, Sweden, Czech Republic, Austria, Switzerland have played with far more freedom and, and probably exceeded what they really should be really capable of because there just isn't the same expectation level on them. So I've got friends in Austria and when they, when they lost that game, they, they weren't blaming anybody. They said, oh, well the team was better than us. So they could go out and give it a good go. And they nearly did it because Anotovic had the ball in the net and it was ruled out. Switzerland won their game. You know, they knocked the French out. That was, It's just a free hit to them. If England had lost to Germany, the team would have been vilified, you know. Um, that's the, and if they lose to Ukraine, its stakes have actually gone up now. Yes. And some people might say they weren't expected to beat Germany. But everybody in this country now, everybody will expect them to beat Ukraine. So if they slip up on Saturday, my God, are they going to come in for some criticism? Yeah, and I saw last night, um, it was BBC News, the sports reporter was stood outside Wembley. The Ukraine match had just finished. And he said, Ukraine weren't very good. England have got this one. And I was like, fancy saying that? You know, and how insulting to the Ukraines that like, well, that's nothing to worry about. You know, we're virtually through to the semi-final. You still got to go and play the game. And, you know, if the Ukrainians have seen that, God, I mean, they're going to, you know, be so fired up for the game. I thought it was an awful thing to say and, you know, does increase the pressure as well if the players are allowed to watch that kind of thing on television. True, absolutely. But, Ian, I could talk to you for hours and hours. It's been absolutely fascinating, but I am just aware of the time and so... Um, I will just kind of finish it. But if people want to find you on your YouTube channel or anywhere else, where can they find you? Uh, well, my name is Ian Cheeseman and it's spelled as it sounds, Cheese Man. And uh, you can either search that on YouTube, you can search it on your podcast platform. So you would find my, uh, at the moment, we're in the rest during the close season. But once the new season starts again, uh, the podcast, weekly podcast will come back. It's called Forever Blue. So you can put Forever Blue in as you search, or you can put in in Chi and Cheese, and it's the same on on uh, the uh, the YouTube channel. And as well as doing match day vlogs, you see visual versions of some parts of my podcast. I've done some interviews, for example, with um, 
with a, a, an astronaut called uh, Doug Hurley who actually flew the last shuttle mission with Atlantis and went up to the International Space Station just recently. He's a City fan, he's an American City fan. I've become pals with him. I tweeted him when he was in space, he replied and I've recorded another video with him that I'm going to uh, put up soon this week where he talks about Mars and that film with the Martian with Matt Damon in it and all right. Shit with Lewis Hamilton when he showed him round uh, the Johnson Space Station. Fascinating man. And I've done feature interviews with players like Zabaleta and um, uh, Rodney Marsh and Kevin Horlock and people like that. So those are the, you know, those are. The, and if you follow me on Twitter uh, at Ian Cheeseman, which is very simple, then everything I do basically I tweet out on there. So if you want more of me, that's how to do it. You want less of me. Don't follow me on Twitter. Don't go surfing. <laughs> uh, and then you'll never see me again. <laughs> I watched some of your YouTube channel yesterday um, in preparation for doing this interview. And, and there was just so much good stuff on there. And I could see why you got so many followers on it. And I ended up dreaming about it last night. I was, I'd watched so much of it. I, Eastlands was in my mind and there was some kind of something weird going on. And I was like, oh, that's because I've watched too much of Ian's videos. But I can't heartily recommend that you go and have a look at Ian's channel because it's uh, fantastic and a lot of hard work goes into it. Well, I've tried. I, mean, I, I left the BBC um, sort of four years ago and, and had to carve out a new career for myself and uh, decided, uh, almost by accident, fell into being a YouTuber. But other YouTubers tend to, uh, not, not all, but, but a lot of YouTubers tend to either all be about themselves, my opinion is this, my opinion is that, which I, 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 that's not my personality, um, so I decided to go down the route of interviewing fans. I watched Arsenal Fan TV, became, which became very popular about the same time as I was um, doing my starting my channel. But that's all about trying to get opposition fans to look at your channel, because it's all about turning on your own club, people being in meltdown, your own fans being in meltdown. So every time mm -hmm. Arsenal lost the game, a group of about five or six Arsenal fans would be videoed saying how much they thought Arsene Wenger was an idiot, they should get rid of him. And, and then, so if you're a fan of City, United, Liverpool, whatever, every time Arsenal lost, you go, oh, I must watch Arsenal fan TV. It'll be hilarious. And then right. you have somebody going to meltdown saying, oh, bloody man, I've got to get rid of him. And I thought, do I really want to do that? Do I want to have a channel where everybody laughs at City fans? Mm. I mean, there'll, there'll be some people who may still think that it's it's funny when City have lost the game but I treat fans with complete respect um, I don't set up people I don't I don't go looking for certain views I just let genuine people express their honest sensible views so that means that probably fans of other clubs most of the time aren't interested in watching it especially if City are winning all the time and perfect example of that uh, of who I'm aiming my channel at is that when they lost the Champions League final, I knew nobody would be interested in it. Um, so maybe 5,000 people watched it. If City had won the Champions League, there'd have been 100,000 watched it. You know, it would have made all the difference. But nobody was gravitating towards it, saying, oh, City have lost, I've got to watch it. Because the only reaction I had after the game were three sensible City fans who just gave a very measured, honest opinion. It wasn't anything to laugh at. And they were no. very, you know, very honest. So it doesn't appeal to other people. Um, but I don't mind that. That's that's me. That's how I operate. Um, respect, honesty, integrity. I hope those are all key words of what I do. And um, uh, hopefully have now secured three sponsors for next season, which means I can continue to do what I'm doing for at least one more season. And that's I will continue excellent. to do it in, a, in an honest way. Um, which is not disrespectful to anybody. But you see, and that's what I remember most about you, for, well, not most, but at um, GMR when I worked there, you were the first Manchester City fan I'd really come across. And, uh, and I thought you were just so nice, so balanced, so reasonable, not kind of anti-United or, you know, anti-anyone else or, you know, overly pro-City. You were just so balanced and it was, and I knew that I could come to you and do an interview like this and it wouldn't be kind of all hate United, hate Liverpool, hate, well, you know, hate everybody else. Um, I knew it would be balanced. And, and I think that speaks volumes about you. 
Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I try to treat everybody with respect and um, I had some very, very happy years at the BBC and a lot of people um, like yourself um, that I spent time with as a placement or, and, and I've always tried to help every single person to the best of my ability and to try to encourage them to be what they are, to be the best they can be and and to be to be honest um, you know so um, it's obviously um, sort of worked with you and I'm pleased to see you developing and I've seen other people I mean um, um, Mark Chapman's a good example a match of the day two commentator mm -hmm. came and spent a month as a work placement with me the, right at the very beginning of his career and when I left the BBC he went on his social media platform to say uh, which he didn't need to, and I'm not sure I can really take the credit for this. But he actually said on his meet, so I wouldn't be where I am today without Ian Cheeseman. Oh, lovely! And I and I thought well, I was only I, I was only with you for a month. When I could have possibly have made any difference to you, but you just try to to be nice to people and help people, and you know, hopefully, you know, you know what you 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 sow you reap at some point in the future. Yes. Cost yes. nothing to be nice. No. No, it doesn't. And I hope that you go on reaping, Ian, with your work. Thank you. I'll, I'll try. I mean, I, I'm at the other end of my career now, so I reckon I've, uh, I've got at least five years left in me yet. But, um, you know, you're at a different stage in your life and there'll be people potentially a lot younger watching me. And, uh, you know, I've had to do a lot of adapting as I've gone along. Uh, but, you know, where, I am where I am now. And, uh, I'm very, very, I consider myself to be very, very lucky um, and to have lived the dream that I've done. Um, and I'll try to continue to enjoy what I can in the ne next five years and then I'll just disappear into the distance and, and be a fan again. Mm, but your work will always be there, thanks to the internet. It's always accessible. Yeah, I suppose so. I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah, yeah, I suppose it is. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> anyway, Ian, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. And if you enjoyed this interview, um, please remember to like the video. And if you'd like to watch more videos of me interviewing different people from all walks of life, um, can, if you consider subscribing and then you'll get to know when the interviews are up first before anyone else. So until next time, thank you very much for watching.